Scala was designed as a multi-paradigm language that supports both functional and object-oriented programming. Its historical roots come from Java and from functional languages like ML. It's originally designed to be a scalable language which allows the libraries to extend the language in non-trivial ways by adding new built-in types, new control structures, and other interesting goodies. It compiles to the Java virtual machine and allows interoperability between Java and Scala. And it's become quite popular, both for distributed systems programming and for data science. Significantly, Twitter has adopted Scala and um, Apache as well in the data science realm. There's a Chicago meetup for Scala, which you should check out. Scala has a redevelop print loop like Scheme, so you can just type things in and they come right out. And you can type in the kinds of things you expect. Um, but it's interesting to try typing in expressions that actually make non-trivial use of Java's libraries. Let me just type this one in. Uh, so I'll go to the Scala redevelop print loop and type this in. Let's see what happened here. I created a variable called dir, which is a file in Java's using Java's file type. Then from that file, I'm going to call the list files function, which will give me a list of files. And now I'm filtering that based on some criteria. So I want to know, is it a directory? And does the name start with C? And so listing out those things, it appears I have three of them in my current temp folder, uh, which are listed there. In Scala, everything is an object. So the number five, just an object. You can invoke methods on these. And the interesting thing is that there's not really a distinction between operators and methods or functions in Scala. Operators are just treated like any other method. And in addition to the sort of things you expect on integers in Java, Scala gives you some additional methods that you can use, such as max and so on and so forth. Um, a beautiful thing in the language is that there is real no, really no distinction between a method and a binary operator. Anytime you have an expression that, uh, with a method that takes only one argument, you can write that expression um, without putting the dot and the parenthesis. So 5 plus 6 is the same as 5 dot plus open paren 6. Scala is a statically typed language. This program is rejected by the compiler. The REPL, in addition, will print out type information as you go. So um, we've seen here this variable declared is actually a file. There's a large type hierarchy in Scala, but the important thing for you to know right now is simply that Java's object type matches a type in Scala called anyref. So um, there are primitive types in Java that map to primitive types in Scala, reference types in Java map to reference types in Scala, and then the object type has this uh, universal type. Let me just show you one other feature of this type hierarchy, which is interesting. So if you know in, in uh, Java, the base types and the object types are completely separate. And so it's impossible to write a function that works over either a base type or an object type. You have to pick. Um, and so Java does auto boxing and unboxing in order to get around that. It converts int to integer, and therefore you can put an integer into a list and things like that. Um, this can be a little bit awkward. Scala improves on this by adding a type called any, which is either a base type or an object type. So it unifies those two types. Like most of the languages you're familiar with, Scala includes mutable variables. Mutable variables in Java are declared with their type as they are in C. And in Scala, there's not much difference except the type information is optional. Scala will infer it.
as do recent versions of Java. For immutable variables, Java has a notion of final variable, which you can write down if you want. And Java actually enforces that final variables don't get changed, mostly. Um, C has a similar notion of const, but of course, as with all things in C, this is very easy to get around. Instead, Scala treats mutable and immutable variables at sort of at equal status. Um, their immutable variables are not second class citizens like you might see them in Java or C. So the word val um, indicates an immutable variable. We can declare a val here and initialize it. And you can see here the REPL will print out that I have the value x, which is a string, and it is assigned the value dog. Um, if you type in an expression in Scala without assigning a variable, then Scala will create a variable for you to hold the temporary value from that expression, here called res13. Um, it's just like I had declared it so I could actually print out, for example, res13 uh, concatenated with x, and I get dog dog out. Scala is expression oriented, and you remember we showed you C's comma expressions and schemes begin expressions. These are sequences of expressions where the first in minus one expressions are executed for side effect, and the return value is the value of the last expression. Well, this happens in scheme as well, and excuse me, in Scala as well. And in Scala, we write them with curly braces. So between curly braces in Scala and separated with semicolons, we can have a sequence of expressions um, that are executed for side effect where the value of the expression is the final thing written. So the semicolons are actually optional. They're typically left out because we uh, can use new lines to indicate the semicolon. Methods in Scala require type annotations for parameters. I can do that. And now I can invoke plus on, say, a couple numbers and get a result. Um, the plus function requires annotations on the parameters, but in this case, I can leave them off the return type. And you can see the Scala interpreter figures out the return type for me. So this is just type inference. Um, so if you try to leave off the parameter types, however, even one of them, Scala will get mad. The return types are required for recursive methods because it's difficult to infer them. Um, and you can see here the body of the function is just an expression and its value is returned. So here's the factorial function written in Scala. So I've defined the factorial to take an integer and return an integer. And if the integer is the base case, I return one. Otherwise, I return the value of n times the result of the recursive call on n minus one. This can also be written out with compound expressions for side effects. So if I type something like this in, um, I'll actually print out what's happening as I do the recursive calls. And you can see here that what I've got is, initially I'm calling the factorial function with five. So um, I'd say I'm called with five, then we're making a recursive call, called with four, making a recursive call, et cetera, et cetera, down to no recursive call. Um, so the syntax here is, it looks a lot like um, C, but or Java, but th these things, it's important to note that there's no statements here. These are all just expressions. So the curly braces in um, Scala are expressions, not statements. Methods and fields are very similar in Scala. They look not a million miles uh, apart. In fact, you can sort of define um, x to be 1, and you can say x plus 2 or x plus 3. And that doesn't look that different from uh, creating the value you know, y, which is um, 1. 
and now I can write y plus 3. So fields and methods are similar. So what's the difference here? Fields and methods are similar, but they have different compilation techniques. So here we have the class C I'm defining with a value, that's a field, and a def, which is a method. And I just want to show you a little bit about how the, this gets compiled in Scala. So if we look at the class file that Scala generates for C, you'll see that it has one field. This is a final field because X is immutable. It's a value. Um, I've got an accessor method for X. So this is when we uh, access a field, we always access it through this accessor. But note the field itself is private. Um, for a method instead, we just have, in this case, the accessor, um, which is here generating a constant. So what this means is that the val and the definition, they're different in terms of when the initializer is executed. So, so note that the initializer here for this uh, field is going to be executed when the class is created. So when the class is created, we put the value for the field. Whereas in the case of a method, any code that's here won't be executed at all uh, unless we actually invoke that method. So the value then is strict in its initialization, whereas definitions are not strict. And of course, the fact that definitions are not strict is significant for the fact that we can write them recursively. It's also interesting to look at how mutable fields are compiled in Scala. So here I have the value, the immutable x, and the variable or the mutable z. And if you look at the output of the uh, compiler, what you'll see is that we have fields for both. As you might expect, x is final and z is not. Um, and in addition, we have accessors for both x and z but we have a mutator only for z. Both x and z are going to be initialized in the constructor. So that's basic Scala. To make interesting programs, you need interesting data. And so in Scheme, when we create interesting data, we do it with consoles. And if you remember consoles, it's sort of the catch-all. It works for everything in Scheme. So if you want a string and an integer, you put them in there. And if you want a list of integers, you put it in there. Most languages that are statically typed, and even some that are dynamically typed, aren't that much of a free-for-all. They usually distinguish two different kinds of structured data. So in C, for example, we have structures and arrays. In Scala, we have tuples and lists. So tuples correspond to structures in C. So tuples have a fixed number of items, but they can be of any type. So you can declare whatever you like, you know, a, a string and an integer and, a, and an array, you know, my three fields. Lists have a variable number of items, so we don't know how many there are, but we usually know something about their type. So we're going to require that they all have some shared type, so they're homogeneous in some sort. The, in Scala, we have variants here for immutable and mutable types. And um, Scala significantly has a feature called pattern matching, which allows us to um, interrogate or look into structured data in a fairly straightforward way. So the mutable types of Scala, and in fact, Scala's entire collections hierarchy is quite large. So you can click here and check out a little bit about Scala's collections. Um, but for now, we're going to be mostly drilling into the immutable side of the collections hierarchy. There, there is a whole mutable side, there, but these are completely separate. So unlike Java, where mu immutable things are simply mutable ones where they've taken certain methods away from you, uh, Scala has two completely separate type hierarchies for the mutable and immutable structures. Um, in addition, you've got any other kind of list classes you might want to have, such as those in Java, or you could import your own.
Um, Scala does also support native Java arrays through its array types. One thing that can be confusing in terminology is the distinction between a field and the data that the field refers to. This gets particularly confusing with mutability. So I may have a mutable field, an immutable data, or vice versa. Let me just show you an example. Here's in Java, a mutable linked list. So um, the list type in Java is mutable and therefore um, I can add things into the list, no problems, um, and the list can change over time. But in this case, I declared the, the field XS to be final, and therefore if I attempt to reassign that field, I'll get an error. So this is uh, an illegal reassignment. So that's a mutable structure that's referred to by an immutable variable or field. In Scala, we can express the opposite, um, which is an immutable linked list with a variable reference. You can also do this in Java, but I've chosen, it's easier in Scala. Scala has genuinely immutable lists. So here is a list, 456. You cannot change this list. It's impossible, but you can put something in front of the list, create a new console in front of the existing list, and then reassign the variable. So the variable can be reassigned, um, but you can't mutate the list itself. So this list, this is the way you would actually try to reassign location one, where the five is. Um, this is an attempt to get the list four, seven, six. It's not gonna work in Scala because these lists are immutable. You're not allowed to change them. Okay, so let's look at tuple types first, and then we'll look at list types, and then we'll look at functions over these. So immutable tuples in Scala are pretty straightforward. Uh, here's a pair. The pair has um, two values in it, five and hello. And the structure of the type sort of mirrors the structure of the value. So um, you can see here as many elements as I have in the tuple, I will have in the type of that tuple. Um, in addition, it's really straightforward to get out things from a tuple. So this is how you build a tuple just with parentheses and commas. To tear things out of the tuple, you just use um, these field accessors. So this access is the first element, that'll be five. And of course, there's a corresponding dot two to get the second one. It's interesting to compare this with Java. So Java doesn't support tuples. Um, and in order to do it, you'd have to define them yourself. So this is sort of a generic pair class um, in Java where you can construct a pair. One way to think about a tuple is it's the same thing as an object, but the, the fields don't have interesting names. The fields are just named underscore one, underscore two, underscore three, etc. So if you want a sort of quick and dirty object, you can use a tuple, and then you don't have to worry about the names of the fields. With tuples, I can use pattern matching to get the values out. So here's a function a, which takes a pair of integers and matches on them. So what it does is it takes the two integers and then adds them together. Scala compiles this pattern match to the following sort of code, if you like, in Java. So what it does, first it looks to see if the pair is null. If so, it throws an exception. Otherwise, it grabs the first element and the second element. It puts them into the variable names that you've chosen here, in this case, x and y. And then it just executes the body of the match. So that's immutable tuples. Let's now look at lists. In Scheme, we had linked lists built with consoles. So for example, I could define the list with 11, 21, 31, 41 as follows here. Um, in Scala, we use an infix operator instead of the word cons. It's pronounced cons. So this is the cons operator in Scala. It's just used quite commonly, and so we don't use the characters. We use the double colon. It's um, a method of the list class. and it's 
um, unusually right associative. So in this case, when I write um, 41 double colon nil, uh, in that case, the method is actually coming from nil. So this is nil invoking the method on 41. Um, in other words, if I write uh, nil dot double colon 41, right, I get the list with 41. Um, in its infix form, we write it this way. Um, the convention here in Scala is simply that if the method name ends with a colon, then the arguments get swapped in the operator form. All right, so um, here we're building up the list with 11, 21, 31, 41, and nil, um, and that will build up this structure here. For lists, it's common to use list constructors instead of the cons operator, just like it is in Scheme. So Scheme has the list function, which uh, takes parameters and builds up a list. Similarly, Scala has a list um, factory function. You can think of it like a constructor that is going to build up uh, a list, in this case, with three elements. Just like we have ways to access the first and second and third elements of a tuple, we also have ways to access the two elements of a linked list cell. So in Scheme, they had the rather bizarre names car and cutter. Um, in Scala, we have more conventional names for them, head and tail. But in fact, head and tail aren't used that much in Scala. We're much more likely to write functions over lists using pattern matching. So how does pattern matching happen over lists? Well, um, I can write a match over a list type. And in this case, my match body will need two case statements because there's two ways I can actually form a list. Either the list could be empty or it could be a con cell. This is different from a pair. If you think about a pair, there's only one way you can have a pair. The pair is a pair. Um, so what does Scala do with this list code? Well, it looks uh, to see if the variable here is uh, nil, in which case it's going to say the list is empty. Otherwise, it looks to see if the um, list is a con cell. If the list is a con cell, then it will proceed. Otherwise, it's going to throw an exception. Um, so in this case, this actually catches null as well. So if, if the list happens to be a badly formed object, it's like outside of um, what's allowed, uh, we'll get an exception. But if it is an instance of this class, so this is the colon colon, uh, which is what's called a con, a con cell in Scala. So if, if it points to a con cell, then we're good. And what are we going to do then? Well, we'll treat it like a con cell, and then we'll grab the head, we'll grab the tail, and then we execute the body that you specified. Okay, so note that the head is given the name you've chosen here, the tail is given the name you've chosen here, and then we just execute the body. One thing that's really powerful about patterns is that they can nest. So this is a function which takes a list of pairs and prints out the second integer in the list. Um, so what am I doing here? Well, this function says if the list is nil, well, I don't have a second element, so I'll just say it's empty. If the list only has one element, so it's anything, this is the wild card, means I don't care, I don't care what it is. So anything followed by nil, that means I only have one con cell. So it's one con cell with nil following. This is already a nested pattern because the, the double colon here is matching a con cell and the nil is specifying what the value of the second element of the con cell is. So if I have this kind of structure, then I can say the list has one element. So what does two element list look like? Well, I'll have something in front of 
my pair in front of the rest of the list. Now the rest of the list here might be nil, it might be a whole bunch of stuff, we don't know, we don't care, because all I'm caring about here is the second integer. So in the second element, I can further deconstruct that um, to get the first element out, don't care about the second one. And this is one of the uh, many ways to format output in Scala. Here I'm doing what's called a string interpolation. This dollar with curly braces allows you to identify a term that will get substituted into the string. So this is fun to run. Let's actually run it and see what we get out. Yeah, and in fact, you can see the second int is 21. Like anything new, pattern matching may take a little bit of time to get used to, but once you get used to it, it really does improve readability. Here's the same code written out with accessors uh, instead of pattern matching. And so the, the one that I want to drill in on though is this. So this is on excess, take the tail, then the head, then the first element. So this is the kind of thing that I personally um, may get lost on. Um, so whereas I think the version in the pattern match is much easier to read. So um, here I'm taking the second element and it's uh, the first uh, part of the pair. So uh, getting this right, it, it tends to be quite error prone if you're doing this kind of nested access. So let's write some simple functions over lists using pattern matching. The first one I'll write is called is empty. What does it do? Well, it takes a list and returns a Boolean. So what are we going to look at? Well, we're going to see on the list, is it nil or is it a cell? If it's nil, let's return true. If it's a console, we return false because if there's a console there, then the list is not empty. Let's try to write the head function. So what is the head function going to look like? Well, I'm going to take a list and return the first element of it. So I need to do a match. Um, well, the case that I'm interested in is the console. So let's suppose I have um, a console and I'll mail, name the things Y and YS. So if I have uh, that case, and I need to write the case word here. So if in this case, what I want to do is just return uh, Y. So that's kind of what I want. Let's uh, run this in Scala and um, see what happens. And you'll get, a, you'll get a notice here, which is it, it's actually giving us a warning that the match may not be exhaustive. Um, and in particular, it fails on nil. That's a great thing for us to get because it means that um, we're missing a case. So this is not what we want. Um, you can see what actually happens if I run this code on nil. So what's the head of nil? Um, oh, I get something quite terrible. <laughs> and you know, it's an exception on, on this list. Um, so, what would I like to do instead? Well, I probably don't have a better choice, but I could at least note that I'm actually meaning to do this. So I could actually use a more meaningful exception. So the one I'll use is what's called a no such element exception. That's a much better error message for a user to get than null pointer exception or whatever it is, a match error, which doesn't mean anything to the user. Um, Similarly with tail, what we do is we simply return the tail of the list. So this gets the first element, this gets the second element. Um, so what I've just done is written some functions that are accepting lists as arguments. This is a little bit different than the built-in methods, which um, instead uh, you invoke using this dot notation. So the head method um, is a method of the list class, where th what I've just written is just um, a method of my own class and I'm, I've written it to take a list as a parameter. Um, so just be aware of this. When we're writing stuff in class, we'll typically write them as this kind of um, method that takes the list as an argument, whereas the built-in ones are all built in. Things get exciting when we start writing loops and imperative programs are always oriented around mutability,
And therefore, what they typically do is loop over and change the state until the state gets to a certain point where they stop. When we're writing functionally, we typically try to deprecate as much as possible the mutability. And that means looping doesn't make any sense because if I'm not changing the state, well, how can I loop? I'll, I'll never stop. I'll either never start or I'll never stop. So what do we do instead? Well, we emphasize recursive programming where we invoke with new parameters over and over again until the parameters actually change. We don't have to mutate anything locally. And what this means is that when we're programming in a functional language, we need to have really good implementations of uh, method calls and recursive functions. All right, so let's look at a prototypical recursive function over lists, which is the length function. So what is the length function going to do? Well, it takes a list and it's going to match on that list. If the list is empty, we return zero. Otherwise, if we have a console, then we want to return one plus the length of the tail. Okay, so this is a typical way to write the length function using pattern matching. Um, before I move on, let's do a few optimizations of this. One thing you notice is that the length function actually doesn't depend upon the type of its argument at all. Um, so we'd really like this length function to work for any kind of list. We can do that by using what's called generic parameters. So here I have a type parameter x. This is always put before the value parameter for the function. This function will work for any type x. So the way you read this is the length says for any x, give me a list of x and I'll give you an int. We can also optimize this a little bit for readability by leaving out y because we don't actually use y on the right hand side and so the program becomes a little bit easier to read if we don't uh, use a name for that variable. Okay, let's think about what this function does and we'll do it on a list here, um, one, two, three. So what's happening here is that when I execute the length function on this list, what I'm really executing it on is the list one, two, three, which is constructed from the list factory method. Um, so it has three consoles, one, two, and three, and you can sort of draw out what that looks like. So we have three cells, one, two, three. And what's happening here is the length function is getting a pointer to the first one. So what does it do? Well, the length function is going to look at the pointer and try and see what type of object it's pointing to. Is it pointing to the nil object or is it pointing to a cons object? Since it's pointing to a cons object, the length function is going to take the first element of the con cell and assign that to y. It's going to take the second element of the con cell and assign that to ys and then it's going to execute the body of the con cell. So here y will be one, ys is gonna be the list two, three, nil. And what happens? Well, we end up invoking uh, the one plus the length of ys. So here ys gets substituted in. Um, we're gonna do that again the second time we invoke uh, for this recursive call. Uh, we will do exactly the same. So in this case, y is going to match the first element of the list, which is two. Ys is gonna match the rest of the list, which is three, uh, three nil. And again, we're gonna therefore do this uh, substitution and we end up with one plus one plus the length. And now we continue again and we'll end up with one plus the length of nil. And now this case, can immediately terminate. So this does not do a recursive call. So we'll immediately terminate on nil to get zero. And now we can do the additions going back. Okay, so 
what's nice about this is that the expression on the on the board tells you everything you need to know about the state of the computation. You don't really need this picture. So um, when we're reasoning about Java, it's very important to sort of keep track of where you are in the link structure and all that stuff. Um, that's not important here because we're programming immutably and it doesn't really matter whether we have one version of 123 or a different version of 123. It's, it's not important. Uh, aliasing doesn't really matter when we have immutable programs. Let's do another example where we append two lists together. Now, of course, appending two lists together, it's um, not obvious what I mean by that when I'm talking about immutable programming because I'm not allowed to mutate the lists. So the, we use the word append here, even though what we're doing is creating a new list composed of the previous two. Um, the, the type here is, again, generic in X. So appending doesn't depend upon the kind of list we're appending. We do the same thing. We put two cat, lists of cats together, two lists of dogs together. It's exactly the same procedure. And so what are we doing? We're taking one list of uh, and another list that have the same type, and we're going to return a list of that type. So what we're doing is looking at one of the lists, in this case, because lists are um, pointing to their, uh, because lists are pointing down, we, we, it makes more sense for us to match on the first list than the second. So what we're going to do here is match on the first list. And if the first list is nil, well, we can simply return the second list. Yeah, nil appended to something? Well, it's just the thing. We don't have to do anything. Um, whereas if we actually have an element here, well, what do we need to do? Well, let's take the Z's, that's the remainder, and append that in front of Y's. Um, and then I can construct a new console pointing to that thing. Okay, so what's happening here? Again, if you just think about this in terms of expressions, I've got um, let's take an example, one, two, nil in front of three nil. And so what I'm gonna do is go down um, just as we did for the length function, we'll just apply the body over and over again until we get to the base case. So in this, in this version, the first time z is bound to one and z's is bound to two nil. So when I do the recursion, I'm gonna have one prepended in front of the result of the recursive call. On the second recursive call, z is going to be 2 and z is going to be nil. So I've got 2 in front of the recursive call with nil. Now the recursive call with nil immediately returns and so we'll end up with 1, 2, 3. And so at that point um, everything's just going to return and we've built the, the thing that we wanted. So if you think of this one sort of what's happening uh, visually in the object sort of picture is we started off with uh, one, two, uh, nil, and three nil. And what we're doing here is going down the list and then constructing a new list. So if the result here, what it's gonna look like is we will first uh, create a console with two in front of the old list, and then it, uh, create a console with one again in front of the old list. So what we've got is the, the a copy of XS, but Y's is shared. So if you think about the running time of this method, it's very asymmetric, right? So I could have a billion elements in Y's, doesn't matter. Um, the only thing that's going to affect my running time here is the length of the first argument, xs. So the con cells are created for 1 and 2, but the con cell for 3 nil is uh, reused. All right. So what we're doing here is joining two lists with this append function, and it's returning a new list, not changing either of the existing two.
Um, and the second list is going to be shared now. So what we've done is we've created a new sort of entry point into the second list. So we had our two lists originally, and now we have this third list, which is sort of joined on or sort of glommed on to the one of them. All right. Um, and one thing that's really nice about thinking about functional programs in an immutable world is all you need to know, know to understand what's going on is the expression. You don't need to think about this kind of um, picture. <laughs> uh, you really don't. But I, I, I'm drawing it up here just because I think it's helpful, but it's really not necessary to understand what's happening. All right, so this is uh, very similar to what we would write in Scheme. The syntax is uh, different, but the effect is the same. All right, so in Scheme, we just check if excess is nil. If it is, we return Ys. Otherwise, we do a cons of the car uh, and then the recursive call on the cutter. The built-in function in Scala for appending is uh, got the catchy name triple colon. So three colons in a row, that's the name for the append function in Scala. And um, it is a method of the list class. So in particular, I could have um, two lists here, one to five and 10 to 15. And if I use this method, I will uh, stick them all together. So again, it's worth maybe thinking about this, that this, this method also ends in a colon. So it corresponds to um, running the triple colon method on the first argument. So that's the method call version of that. Um, so remember, if, if a method name ends with a colon, then the arguments are sort of swapped in the infix or operator form. All right, so suppose we have some method and I ask you, what does this do? And let's say I'm gonna do this on an exam, so, um, and I will. So if you're given something like this and you're having to figure out what it does, well, how would you proceed? So the important thing is to note where the induction is happening. And in this case, what am I doing the induction on? Well, it's a function on a list. I'm matching on the parameter on XS. And so, and where's my recursive call? My recursive call here is on Y's. Okay, and Y's is the tail of the list. Okay, so that, that sounds pretty uh, standard. All right, so this is a sort of normal pattern for doing a recursion over a list. So essentially we're going down the elements of the list. So what we need to do is just do some test cases and see what happens. So let's start with um, nil. What, what does this function do on nil? Well, on nil it just returns nil. Ha, that was easy. Okay, um, let's take a list of length one. So let's suppose we have three nil. Well, if I have three nil, then we're going to match three for y and nil for y. So this will be f of nil. Well, we know what that is. That's just nil. Um, and what are we doing over here? We have the list three. Uh, so nil. And now we're going to call this append method on list of three. So list of three with nil in front. Well, that's just going to be list of three. OK, what about on the list two, three? Well. We're going to end up invoking, in this case, uh, f on uh, 3 nil. So again, we've got a console in the front. So we'll run f on the tail, which is 3 nil. And then we'll um, call the append method with the second argument being, in this case, the list of 2. So we end up with 2 over there. OK. Well, we already know what f does on this. It's just going to return the list 3. So now we have the list 3 with the list 2, and that's going to give us 3, 2. Uh, maybe you can already guess what this is doing. But let's do one more case. So if I have 1, 2, 3, well, now I'm going to call f on 2, 3, nil, And 
um, I'm going to append list one. And of course, we know what this is already. We've already just solved it. So f of 2, 3 is just 3, 2. And now we're going to end up with uh, appending 1 to that. And we end up with the list 3, 2, 1. Aha. This is the reverse function. Yay. So this is the way you should proceed whenever anyone asks you, what does this function do? Um, that's how to figure it out.